renowned film director Sergei Eisenstein had a vision. He had discovered in his previous films that by combining images in a particular way, the audience can infer motifs, themes, and arguments. Rather than just watching a film for the plot or the characters, audiences can learn concepts. He called this the intellectual montage. And he caught glimpses of this form in his previous movies. In Battleship Potemkin and October, the intellectual montage was used to argue against the previous regime of the Russian Empire, to dismantle their ideology and expose its hollowness. Now his sights were turned to something grander. He would use the intellectual montage to educate his people on the book which formed the economic and political basis of their new society. Sergei Eisenstein wanted to make a movie based on Karl Marx's Das Kapital. Now, two things you need to know about Das Kapital. First, it is massive. Three volumes in total, a monster of a book. Second, it's an in-depth, extremely technical analysis filled with economics, sociology, and descriptions of the systematic condition of groups of people. It's not a book that lends itself to film. Eisenstein's main inspiration was another dense and difficult book, James Joyce's Ulysses. The novel, a modernist classic, details the day in the life of two citizens in Dublin. It follows them as they go about their daily business in the city. But every page of the book is filled with a rich stream of consciousness that encompasses ordinary thoughts, mythological references, political concerns, historical tidbits, philosophical arguments, literary allusions, conventions from all forms of genres, all woven together in Joyce's poetic prose. So Eisenstein thought it was the perfect way to structure Marx's main arguments in Das Kapital. I'll avoid getting into too much theory here. What we'll focus on is the idea that the culture and political system of a society is a reflection of its economic structure. So like Ulysses uses the walk of a man around the city to explore themes of literature and politics, Eisenstein would film Das Kapital as a walk of a worker in a capitalist city. And every object, every person, every building he encounters would tell a different story from Das Kapital, a different argument against these institutions. So to go through this really quickly, in October, Eisenstein created an intellectual montage to argue against the idea of using religion to justify political power. One of the villains of the movie justifies his takeover with the words, in the name of God and country. And then a series of images appear which criticize the statement by deconstructing the iconographies of church and state. Das Kapital, the movie, would use a similar structure while also combining the stream of consciousness methods of James Joyce's Ulysses. In everyday objects that the man and his wife encounter, we get a series of images that would associate those objects with the larger theme of exploitation, imperialism, and colonization. So in this method, I could film a cup of tea then shots of the wars that were waged to secure the tea trade, the exploitation of farmers and factory workers, and also the social distinction and snobbery associated with the drink. Eisenstein started sketching his ideas. In order to get the maximum arguments out of the intellectual montage, he rated books, articles, newspaper clippings, posters, anecdotes, novels, newsreels, everything he could get his hands on, noting down every detail he could and how it fit in the economic and political arguments of Marx's book. He worked and reworked this idea in hundreds of pages of notes. To get a glimpse of what the movie he was working on would look like, here's an excerpt from his diaries that indicate perhaps a most complete outline. Quote, Throughout the entire picture, the wife cooks soup for her returning husband. Could be two themes intercut for association, the soup cooking wife and the home returning husband. Completely idiotic, all right in the first stages of a working hypothesis. In the third part, for instance, association moves from the pepper with which she seasons food. Pepper, Cayenne, Devil's Island, Dreyfus, French chauvinism, Figaro in Krupp's hands, war, ships sunk in the port. And then he writes in his notes, obviously not in such quantity. Good in its non-banality transition, Pepper, Dreyfus, Figaro. It would be good to cover the sunken English ships with the lid of a saucepan. It could even not be pepper, but kerosene for a stove and transition into oil. In the final section, soup is ready. A thin soup, the husband arrives, socially embittered. The hot, watery liquid compromisingly washes away the pathos. Prospects of bloody skirmishes. And most horrifying of all, social indifference equal to social betrayal. Blood. 
the world in the flames of cataclysm, the Salvation Army, the church militant. The man embraces his wife's skeleton. A neatly darned quilt is pulled over. A surprise for sincere lyricism. She gives him a cheap cigarette. Sentimentality that is much more awful in this context of that final horror. The quilt is pulled over. Under the bed, a pot. With the handle broken off, but a pot all the same. End quote. I could go on, but I'll just let it rest here. I really like this, not only for its grand ambition, but also a glimpse at how Eisenstein's mind worked. Listen to the way he jumps from one idea to another in these short, jerky sentences. It's like the guy even thinks in montage. What we're seeing here is the invention of a completely new genre of cinema. Dense, difficult books could be made accessible through the silver screen. Once the intellectual montage would be fully realized, audiences could get an entire education in the theater. College courses could potentially be condensed in a few hours of movie watching. This would be Eisenstein's magnum opus. This would be him creating a whole new world. Sergei Eisenstein would never be able to make this movie. After the release of October, Eisenstein was on top of the world. He was hailed as the new face of cinema. He and other rising stars of Soviet cinema set off on a world tour. He was meeting luminaries all across Europe, worked with Paramount, and even got in touch with Disney, and developed his style even further while filming revolutionary films in Mexico. Things were looking good for the young director at the end of the 20s. Back in the USSR, the situation was different. Some critics were less than impressed by the new style of Soviet directors. They found the movies difficult to interpret and inaccessible. The audiences, they preferred to watch Hollywood imports rather than the globally acclaimed October. The country was also under the first of the five-year plans, which would restructure the social, political, and economic face of the USSR. A conference was called in 1928. The All-Union Party Conference on Cinema addressed these issues and agreed on certain points. The conference agreed that they needed to bring political order to the cinema. They acknowledged the public's love for action, adventure, and comedy, and that they would need to produce more genre movies that would appeal to the millions while still having good old Marxist values. At the same time, they weren't blind to the fact that they needed to expand the industry. When Eisenstein returned to the USSR in 1934, he found the movie industry was completely unrecognizable. Luna Charsky, the head of the People's Commissariat for Enlightenment, which oversaw cinema, stepped down. Sofkino, which was directly responsible for leading and regulating cinema, was dissolved and replaced by Sayus Kino. Although Sayus Kino would also be replaced by the GUKF a few years later, a lot of these departments will come and go. I don't expect you to remember these names. But there is one name that I do want you to remember. Boris Shumiatsky. Shumiatsky was an old Bolshevik, have enjoyed the party all the way back in 1903. He headed a number of different projects, including working in Iran, becoming rector of the Communist University of Workers of the East, and a member of the Central Asian Bureau. He was described as tireless, hardworking, and meticulous, the perfect administrator. The lack of cinema experience didn't stop the party from being impressed by his other credentials. He was there to shake things up. He wasted no time in imposing order and discipline on the industry. He was there to make the industry bigger and better than it had been before. This was the extent of his ambition. So in 1931, he announced his program for the following year. His goal was to significantly increase, well, everything about the industry. In 1931, 200 films were released. So he announced 500 films for 1932. He wanted 3 billion cinema visits compared to the previous year's 700 million. 1 billion rubles turnover compared to 1931's 400 million. He announced the building of a gigantic film stock factory and three new studios in Central Asia, Belarus, and Eastern Siberia. 100 new theaters in areas around the newly created collective farms. 8,500 sound cinema installations and 50,000 new mobile installations. A tall order, and Shumiatsky would not let anything deter him. I'm not exaggerating. A massive purge occurred in 1932. Entire departments were liquidated, mass firings, arrests, and worse. Shumiatsky's response was to tell his workers to carry on, get back to work. He refused to let anyone off the hook. He dismissed all fears and concerns with the simple, we live in the Soviet Union and we shall be reorganized more than once. 
So the next time your boss rejects your sick leave, think of all the men and women who worked under Boris Shumyatsky. His first major goal for the Soviet film industry, sound. In 1927, the jazz singer taught movies how to talk. It was the transition from the silent movie era to what was then called the talkies. Soviet directors were keen on this new technology. Eisenstein and his friend and rival Pudovkin wrote an article dreaming about the potential of sound in film. Shumiatsky spared no expense. He hired sound specialists from the U.S. to come and install the needed equipment in Moscow and Leningrad. They could reverse engineer this technology to spread it across the land. The USSR now had sound. What would the directors do with this new technology? Two early adopters of sound were Esfir Shub and Ziga Vertov. Esfir Shub was an editor and director, active in the art community from the early days, working with futurist poet Mayakovsky and avant-garde theater producer Meyerhold. She worked as an editor in Goskino in the 1920s and produced her first documentary in 1927. That documentary was about the fall of the Romanov dynasty, where she stitched together whatever little footage was left on the Romanovs and used montage to make a coherent whole. It's considered the first example of a compilation film. Critics praised her bold and innovative techniques. In 1932, she was tasked to produce a documentary about the efforts to bring electricity to the countryside. The result, Komsomol, leader of electrification, was the first sound documentary in the USSR. The documentary follows the efforts of the engineers and workers in electrifying the countryside. But it was more than that. What Esfir did with a simple premise is to create a metaphor of electricity as symphony. The documentary starts with an orchestra, and the music throughout the movie aligns with the images of electric generators coming to life. Pictures of light bulbs lighting up the sound of music almost make it look like an electric waltz. It has an almost sci-fi feel to it, which I guess is a good reflection of how people might have felt seeing their village get electricity for the first time. Other than the music, the sound she captures in the documentary are all incidental. You can barely hear the people talk, making it feel as if you too were in the loud factory. The sounds of machines dominate and overpower, giving prominence to the new technology and its revolutionary potential. Ziga Vertov. We talked about him last episode. He spent his early career making documentary and non-fiction film, where he placed a heavy emphasis on the use of camera techniques to show something new about everyday life. Now he was eager to start doing the same with audio. If Man with a Movie Camera was a master class in editing techniques, Vertov's venture into sound film, the movie named Enthusiasm, did the same with audio techniques. In fact, there are quite a few parallels between Man with a Movie Camera and Enthusiasm. Man with a Movie Camera starts with shots of the camera operator preparing his apparatus, and the movie theater's opening to let the audience in, priming their eyes for the visual feast. Enthusiasm begins with a montage of a woman putting on her headphones and hearing the different sounds of the city. The montage goes back and forth between her putting on the headphones, the sound of the church bells, the sounds of people, the sounds of the city as a whole. It gives you the impression of how joyful and also how disorienting listening to sounds for the first time must be. Enthusiasm is not as well known as Man with a Movie Camera. There are a few reasons for that, but we'll get to that soon. If you watch the films I just mentioned, you'll notice something strange about the sound. Not just the usual limitations of early audio technology, but both Esphere and Vertov used very little dialogue. That's what you imagined sound to be for, right? Instead, sound was just there to add further meaning to the images on screen. There are a million different ways an art can evolve. Things we take for granted didn't have to be that way. Just because the movie industry evolved to have a more theatrical approach to sound, uh, focusing on dialogue, the music being background to advance the plot or the mood of the piece, doesn't mean that's the only way it could be. Shub and Vertov, they grew up with silent movies, so of course their main focus was still on images. The way they developed sound technique in their film show one way the industry could have moved. One way of many. Sound was just one part of the first phase of Shumiatsky's plan. The name he gave his plan was Cinefication, expanding the network of cinema and movie facilities across the countryside, to which he was mostly successful. 
Nowhere near the scale of his ambitious plans outlined earlier. But by 1933, there was a rather impressive 27,578 cinema installations around the country. In 1935, Moscow hosted its first international film festival. Which brings us to the second phase of Shumiatsky's ambitions. To rein in and impose tighter control on the loose cannon cinematographs. The art world of the Soviet Union at large was in a transition phase. There was a new art form in town, socialist realism. If I was to tell you what communist art looks like, what would you think of? You might imagine pictures of uh, hyper-realistic paintings of smiling farmers or factory workers, all happily doing their work under the aegis of the great leader. A common form of socialist realism, for sure. Though the genre at this point was mostly defined by what it was not. The antithesis of socialist realism, the enemy that everyone had to keep at bay. Formalism. Did formalism have a better definition? Not really. Formalism in this context meant that the artist concerned themselves too much with the form of art while neglecting the content. Too much aestheticism, prettifying things, making them confusing for the sake of artistic license. Pretty vague for sure. Formalism had an I'll-know-it-when-I-see-it quality. People regularly accused one another of formalism, and such an accusation ended careers. Socialist realism and attacks on formalism were meant to transform the art of society. The new waged war with the old. Shumiatsky's first target was the father of montage himself, Lev Kuleshov. Kuleshov and his workshop introduced the world to the Kuleshov effect and other editing techniques. And that's exactly why Shumiatsky focused his ire on the hapless director. He wanted to nip this montage nonsense right in the bud. He attacked the films as plotless and being unsuitable for the cinema he envisioned. Quote, A film and its success are directly linked to the degree of entertainment in the plot, in the appropriately constructed and realistic artistic motivations for its development. That is why we are obliged to require our masters to produce works that have strong plots and are organized around a storyline. Otherwise, they cannot be entertaining. They have no mass character. The Soviet screen will not need them. End quote. And worse for a stern taskmaster such as Shumiatsky. These films were undisciplined. They have not yet got used to the discipline of the concrete tasks that our mass audience is setting them. The slogan Cinema for the Millions became the title of his book. His mission? To purge any movie that did not have mass appeal. This did not bode well for our directors. Lev Kuloshov, defeated, wrote articles denouncing his previous films. Pudovkin still continued making films but was frustrated every step along the way. Eisenstein, still off filming in Mexico while this is going on, was spared the brunt of the criticism but he found his prospects severely limited when he returned to the USSR. Dovzhenko? Well, more on him later. The directors had to publicly justify their movies to free themselves from the accusations of formalism. Here's Esfir Shub defending her use of music and electricity montage in Komsomol. Quote, Now, about light bulbs. Komsomol member Paramanova from the light bulb plant is a wonderful person. Paramanova tells me that we have surpassed the U.S. in light bulb production, that we have mastered the technology, and she has even written a book about how to make light bulbs. And now she says, just look at us working. That's precisely what I wanted to show, the absolutely magnificent rhythm of work, the rapid movement of hands. She is smiling. She doesn't even have time to talk. She makes it look easy and fun. And at the same time, this is purposeful work because they are free, because they don't have checks and supervisors because they know they are responsible for fulfilling the plan. And all this lightness and ease unwittingly led itself to waltz. Popov saw this, and he wrote a waltz that absolutely synchronized with the elements. End quote. You can hear how enthused Shub is about her work, so passionate about the tiniest details of what should have been just a mundane documentary. There is creative inspiration here to make something that thrilled and delighted people. And here she is having to defend all these tiny little details against the most mundane of accusations. It's disheartening. Fortunately, Shub kept on making movies well into the 40s. But it gets worse from now on for the more experimental directors. Ziga Vertov's next movie was named Three Songs of Lenin, 
It was a film poem about the growth of the USSR under Lenin's influence. The movie is full of praise for the founder of the country. One of the recurring images is a poignant shot of the empty park bench Lenin used to sit on. The movie returns to the empty bench multiple times at different seasons to show the loss the country is feeling at the absence of their founder. The Three Songs of Lenin combines image and sound montage, an audiovisual symphony. It's beautiful. It's poetic. It's absolute propaganda. It has nothing but praise for the party and its founder. World famous writer H.G. Wells had this to say about the movie. Quote, I had the happiness to see the Three Songs of Lenin. It is one of the greatest and most beautiful films I have seen in my life. I congratulate Giga Vertsov and all those who worked on the film. End quote. Surely you can't go wrong with that. Three Songs of Lenin, like his other movies, received international acclaim for its poetic and filmic qualities. In the USSR, it was criticized for, you guessed it, excessive formalism. Vertov refused to give up his creative techniques, and because of that, he slowly got phased out of the scene. Projects went to other directors, and the projects he did get, he was given little control over the creative aspects of the work. Vertov's career was slipping away from him, under forces he vaguely understood. Years later, a melancholic but defiant Vertov reflected in his diaries, quote, I don't isolate myself, but I am isolated. I am not invited anywhere. I didn't receive an invitation to a conference on historical films. For the film Kasiliev, our cinema, I was not included. The article I was commissioned to write was not printed. There are no exhibition boards for me. They did not ask for my photograph or stills. My silence is taken to be because I keep silent, not that I am kept silent. I need nothing except work. Now the most terrible variation comes. The transformation of the artistic's poetic films into the educational technical. The destruction of all work I have done in our whole group. Once I had iron nerves and an iron will. Of course there are other means, but I am not able to use them. They can't make a businessman out of me. I will not bow down to their feet, the feet of my enemies. The dead catch hold of the living. Always on the outside, Vertov now found himself completely alone. One of the early biographers of Vertov recounts this incident. Quote, They don't love you, said one of the leaders of cinematography in a moment of frankness. Who doesn't love me? Vertov pondered over the phrase when writing his diary. The party and the government? No. The party and the government have given me high orders. The press? No, the press, beginning with Pravda and to the last newspaper in the Arctic Circle, have given me the highest praise. Public opinion? No. Public opinion and its best representatives, leading writers, workers of the collectives, artists, all rose up to defend my film work. So who is it then that doesn't love me? The artist didn't find an answer to that question. Unquote. Who indeed? We're almost there. Shumiatsky's justification for putting so much restriction on directors was this. Filmmaking is a collaborative process. There was too much emphasis put on directors. This diminished the role of camera operators, the scriptwriters, and others involved in making a movie. Which is not a bad argument, if you ask me. But if that's truly what he was aiming for... You can't help but wonder if there was a better way to go about it. He drafted a process that every cinematographer had to adhere to. This was the thematic planning. The purpose of thematic planning was to streamline movie making. Every year a draft plan was sent to workers meetings and literary organizations for their approvals. Studio personnel took the input from these meetings and made any required changes to the draft plan. When the various cinema and political committees discussed these changes and made their final approval, Then the various cinema and political committees discussed these changes and made their final approval. Every film had to be fully storyboarded, the script approved at every level, and every camera shot and angle pre-planned. Changes to the film during shooting was absolutely forbidden. The level of bureaucracy and authorization in the official procedure is bad enough. It got even worse in reality. The many cooks in the kitchen could at any time come in with proposed changes that the directors were obliged to follow. Production could be stalled or halted at any time. Films could be recalled as many as 17 times before finally getting cancelled. And each head of department was so eager to make changes and add their own input. This was all in the efforts to appease the great art critic, the final arbiter of taste. 
the comrade on top of the Kremlin. Yes, I guess it's about time to address the big mustached elephant in the room. Yosef Vissarionovich Stalin, the man of steel himself. While he was nominally in charge after Lenin's death in 1924, it was only in 1928 that you could say his reign truly began. Yes, 1928, the same year the All-Union Party Conference of Cinema was held. The Conference of Cinema which started the transformation of the industry. This was not a coincidence. The five-year plans that the industry was caught under? Stalin's plan. The massive reorganization that Shumiatsky told his workers to just walk off? Stalin's first, and mildest, comparatively speaking, purge. The thematic planning of the movie industry? Part of Stalin's plan to create a command economy with centralized planning. Eisenstein being forced to return to the USSR and not given much to do once he was back? Stalin. Vertov's fall from grace? Rumor has it that Stalin didn't appreciate not being included in the three songs of Lenin. And when Stalin disapproves, that's pretty much the end of it. Stalin ran the country like the world's most nightmarish corporation. Infinite bureaucracy and layers of authorization that control your every move. Constant structuring and restructuring at every level of the government body. Overlap of roles and functions. Jealous heads of departments sabotaging one another to curry favor from the ones above them. Manipulating facts and reality to appease the stakeholders at the party. And on top of it all, the image-conscious head of the company who, while wielding absolute power, keeps emphasizing how they're all one big, happy family. By all accounts from friends and enemies, Stalin was a charismatic, gregarious man, full of high spirits and joviality, the life of the party, but someone who could also turn on you with a terrifying drop of a dime. In fact, it's striking how capricious being caught in Stalin's crossfire was. One person might give the harshest criticism of the leader and only receive an you're absolutely right comrade, while another gets executed for a slight faux pas. Maybe that was the whole plan, keep people on their toes. Stalin also showed great interest in the arts, not only as an ideological means to control people. Stalin was also a well-read autodidact who fancied himself a thoughtful art critic. He had a special fondness for movies. Stalin had Shumiatsky install a film projector within the Kremlin. Every night after their long work days, Stalin and his inner circle would retire to the screening room and continue the party there. Stalin would watch and re-watch his favorite movies. He would pick the latest national and international films to satisfy his tastes and give him an impression of what life outside the Kremlin was like. He would take notes on the films. He would invite the directors of new films and give them his notes directly. What must it have been like to be a director having their movies reviewed by Joseph Stalin? Here's a story recounted in the book Fear and the Muse Kept Watch. Quote, Shostakovich reputedly told a story of an unnamed director sitting in front of Stalin at a private screening of his film who found himself in such a state that he turned into a giant receiver set. Every squeak that came from Stalin's seat seemed decisive. Every cough seemed to toll his fate. During the screening, Stalin's secretary came in and handed the boss a dispatch that he read in the dark and then exclaimed, What's this rubbish? Whereupon the poor director passed out. No doubt then, the movies coming out of the USSR would reflect the taste of their leader. So what kind of movies did Stalin want? Here are a few themes that show up in movies at this time. First, we have the collective farming and collective industry. Let me explain a little. Part of the first five-year plan was the collectivization of agriculture. Collective farms were spread around the country. There was a big roadblock to this plan, and that was the kulaks. In the 1920s, Lenin enacted the new economic policy which allowed for limited privatization. This policy created a new class of landowners, the kulaks. They were not down on the collectivization of agriculture. So a struggle between the kulaks and the collective farms emerged. If you recall the last episode, I mentioned Ukrainian director Alexander Dovzhenko. I talked about the opening of the Earth film and the poetic imagery that he used to depict the dying of the old man. That's only half the story. The rest of the film, no less poetic, depicts the peasants' aspirations to industrialize their farms and the kulaks who are hell-bent on stopping them. Now, I gotta admit, things get a little difficult here. I really had to think about how much I wanted to present about this topic. This is, after all, a podcast about the history of art 
and I didn't want it to devolve into a catalog of misery and crimes. But it would be negligent to pass over the darker side of this era. Dovzhenko's film Earth depicts the struggle between the peasant farmers and the kulaks. The kulaks are presented as jealously guarding their territory, going as far as to murder the peasant who is calling for industrialization of the farm. It's a good versus evil story. The reality? It's a lot messier. The movie came out in 1930, and maybe we can forgive Dovzhenko's naivete. But in 1932, the fight between the kulaks and the party, the battle for industrialization and collectivization, it led to one of the worst famines of modern history. A horrible and entirely preventable tragedy. What I really want to know is how Dovzhenko felt about all of this. He was, after all, very attached to his country and his land. What did he make of all of this? There are a few things we have to consider. Information was scarce and heavily controlled at the time, and the full extent of the famine wasn't known in the USSR until the 1980s. Dovzhenko also reportedly burned his diaries of the 1930s. What was written there? If we go by his later diaries, which we will get to, we see a very conflicted man. To further complicate matters, Stalin took a liking to the director. After his Ukrainian trilogy, Dovzhenko was hounded by the authorities of his native land. They found his movies too nationalistic and counter-revolutionary. Dovzhenko was only saved from arrest by Stalin's direct intervention. Stalin wrote him a letter urging him to move to Moscow and become one of his directors there. It seemed like Stalin almost thought of himself as a mentor to Dovzhenko. The feeling was likely not mutual. So back to the movies. Another theme after collectivization was the heroism of the Bolshevik party and its leadership. Leaders were now emphasized over the effort of mass groups of people like in previous movies. The exemplar of this style is the 1934 film directed by the Vasiliev brothers, Chapayev. The movie follows our protagonist, the titular Chapayev, a member of the Red Guard during the Civil War. His fierce loyalty to the cause and to the leader, important Stalinist theme there, guides him throughout the movie. Chapayev now was a historical person, and historically, apparently, he was well-liked by the peasantry at the fronts, and the film really tried to play that up. Now, if you think this is just some simplistic propaganda, it is, but it also isn't. The movie is the socialist realism movie par excellence, but there's also something to it. The Vasiliev brothers managed to create a level of complexity to the movie. There is a sense of conflict even within the party. Characters make mistakes, learn lessons, and grow. There is a level of humanity to the characters and their interaction, which you wouldn't expect from a one-dimensional movie of this genre. Stalin loved the movie. He considered it both artistically and ideologically suited to his tastes. Shapayev was on the lips of every film director around the country. It was a model for them to aspire to. Stalin wanted more films like this. He found what he called the Ukrainian Shapayev, a man named Shores. And what better person than his new favorite director, a Ukrainian director to boot, to be given this film? Dovzhenko was given the suggestion to make the movie. He agreed, but put the idea on the back burner while he was occupied with making his other film, Aerograd. During the filming of that movie, Stalin called in Dovzhenko and said, quote, The reason I wanted to see you is this. I spoke to you about Shores last time. I was merely making a suggestion. I simply thought of what you might do in the Ukraine. But neither my words nor the articles in the press place any obligations on you. You have free choice in the matter. If you want to do Shores, go ahead and do it. But if you have other plans, then keep doing them by all means. Don't think you are bound to anything. I called you in to tell you this. End quote. Dovzhenko started work on Shores immediately. And the genre probably most remembered from this era. The combination of socialist realism's emphasis on happy, smiley people and the introduction of sound. The musical. The musical? In the mid-1930s, during all the five-year plans, rapid industrialization and the purges of old Bolshevik members, Stalin declared, Life has become better, comrades. Life has become more joyful. In 1936, a new constitution was unveiled, declaring a whole slew of democratic and economic reforms. On paper, it was one of the most progressive constitutions of Europe, a testament that the country, after all the eggs broken, 
has become a socialist omelette. On paper, the culture was quick to reflect the supposed changes. There was the introduction of mass events, sports, jazz, dance clubs, parties, and yes, the musical, all to express that life has indeed become more joyful. There were two masters of the genre. One, Ivan Pirev, created movies about rural village life. The tractor driver is his most famous one, takes us on a journey of happy and successful farmers living life to the fullest under communism. But Pirev's career will continue into the post-Stalinist era, and his style is still evolving at this point, so I feel like it'll be better to spend time with him next episode. For now, let's look at the next influential musical director, Gregory Alexandrov. Alexandrov worked with Eisenstein in the 1920s. He was part of the group that went across Europe and North America until he got recalled in 1932. His three famous musicals of the 30s are Happy Guys, Circus, and Volga Volga. Personally, I'm not the biggest fan of musicals. Not, not that I have anything against them. They're fine. Just not something I actively seek out. But I genuinely like these films. They were charming, light, and interesting from a historical perspective. The Stalinist musicals made sure to show that the stakes are low and the villains were nothing but weak, petty officials who could easily be overcome. No problems couldn't be solved with a little bit of singing. Circus is the story of an American circus performer who escapes her country because of her horrible crime. She becomes a performer in the USSR, where her act gains love and acclaim. In this movie, Moscow is depicted in this fairy tale light, the kind of glamour only found in musicals. But she does have a problem. Her manager is exploiting her and refusing to let her be together with the charming acrobat she's fallen for. See? He has blackmail material over her. The crime that forced her out of the United States? She had an affair with a black man and had given birth to a mixed-race child with him. 1930s America, right? At the end of the hijinks, the evil manager runs into the middle of the circus ring and reveals the child to the audience. But the movie reminds us, this isn't the United States. This is the USSR. The audience of the circus embrace the child. Each row, people of many ethnic backgrounds, carry the child and sing him a lullaby in their different language, from Georgian to Yiddish. The woman is touched by the reception and becomes a dedicated communist. It's a nice sentiment, if not exactly true to reality. Volga Volga is probably the most famous movie. A village is summoned to Moscow to enter the Music Olympiad. We start with our protagonist, Arrow, a letter carrier, having an argument with her boyfriend, an orchestra conductor. He makes fun of her musical tastes and abilities for not being classically trained as he is. As they go to Moscow for the Olympiads, the village splits into two factions. The classical conductors with their expert training and fancy equipment and highbrow repertoire, and then Arrow leading the rest of the villagers in singing happy folk songs. The movie is a farce with uh, slapstick, mistaken identities, and conflicts with comical conclusions. It also has a lot of interesting things to say about amateur versus professional art, and about solace robust traditions versus pretty but ultimately unsustainable technology. Watching Arrow and her group of amateur but passionate music lovers assert themselves and also have their skills recognized is delightful. It was reportedly Stalin's favorite movie. He prided himself in being able to quote lines from it. I'd be remiss here not to give credit to Lubov, Petrova, or Lova. She was the protagonist of all three of Alexandrov's musicals mentioned above. Alexandrov and Orlova met at the set of Jolly Fellows and got married. Orlova was classically trained in music, dance, and theater. Politically engaged, though interestingly, unlike her character in Circus, she never joins the Communist Party. She was still an active member of the community. She was called the People's Artist in the USSR in 1950s and was to appear in musicals all the way up to her death in the 1970s. Lubov Orlova is the face of Soviet musicals. The aim of the musicals was to reinforce Stalin's life has become happier, life has become joyful. It depicts Soviet life as an attractive, happy fairy tale. If this seems odd, don't forget that in the 1930s, musicals had a very similar function in Hollywood. When you're living in one of the worst conditions of unemployment, poverty, and wealth inequality, as was the Great Depression, you were bound to seek some escapism in the form of movies. The musicals provided solace, an escape from things beyond your control. When you lost your past, live in a shaky present and an uncertain future, then the best place to go is in the timeless fairy tale land of musicals. 
Escapism is used as a pejorative, but I don't think that makes sense to be so dismissive about these movies. There's a lot going on for them. Not just from a historical or sociological perspective, but as an art form as well. Things weren't so great for the industry. The movies that I mentioned above, while big hits and rightfully regarded as classics, were some of the few films that managed to make it through the stifling bureaucratic process. The ever-present attacks on formalism also made it so much harder for filmmakers to get anything done. The cinematographers were given praises and awards, but the division between industry and artists kept growing wider. It's like, imagine being called into your manager's office and getting praised for your creative work, and then being prevented from doing anything like that for the rest of your career. Even being the favorite doesn't mean you are immune from Stalin's micromanagement. After seeing parts of Dozhenko's film Shores, the movie Stalin himself requested, this is the memo Stalin sent to the head of the organization. Quote, Comrade Shumiatsky, 1. Shores has turned out rather crude and uncultivated. You must restore Shores' true physiognomy. 2. Bozhenko did not entirely work out. The writer clearly sympathizes more with Bozhenko than his Shores. 3. Shores' military staff is not visible. Why? 4. It cannot be that Shores did not have a tribunal. In either event, he would not have begun to shoot people for no reason. Yeah, that's rich coming from Stalin. 5. It is not good that Shores looks less cultivated and cruder than Chapayev. This is not natural. Unquote. The circumstances of this memo were extraordinary, but the sentiments weren't. You have to imagine that filmmakers were bombarded with dozens, if not hundreds, of such memos during their film shoot. Boris Shumiatsky, he knew things weren't going as planned. In his original vision for 1932, he had projected 500 films a year. The actual numbers of movies released was so much less. Apparently, heavy restrictions on your creatives and putting every movie through endless scrutinizing and micromanaging really damages the output. Who knew? Shumiatsky realized he had a lot more work to do. He wrote to Stalin asking for permission to go to Hollywood and learn from the industry. He got the approval. So he and a delegation went to Hollywood after the Moscow Film Festival. He returned with some ideas on how to get the movie industry on the right track. What he learned from Hollywood is to give people freedom, to trust your directors and let them work their creative magic with minimal studio interference. Huh, yeah right. Seeing the producer-dominated Hollywood taught Shumiatsky to be even more tyrannical. Tighter controls, more firing of staff, less freedom for the directors. He wanted more centralization of the industry. He wanted to make producers the key manager of the film project, just like they were in Hollywood. But more importantly, he wanted Hollywood. A Soviet Hollywood. A place where all your socialist dreams come true. He proposed a base in Crimea, which had a temperate climate and would help them avoid the long, harsh winters of the north. The plan was to create a studio there for easier set pieces. Shumiatsky predicted that with such a place, they could increase output to 800 films a year. Stalin loved the idea. He even said, Of course we need a cinecity. Objectors cannot see further than their own noses. Can our cinema really rest on a dwarf base? All was set for the greatest achievement of Shumiatsky's career. There is only one problem. And that problem's name is Eisenstein. After being begged, cajoled, and mocked into making a new film, Eisenstein was finally given a project in 1935. The name was Bajan's Meadow. The movie was partially based on Turgenev's story. A tale of a boy in a collective farm who finds out that his father is attempting to sabotage the farm's work. Collective farming and internal enemies, a good old approved Stalinist script. But this was Eisenstein we're talking about. He would do things his own way. And it was a disaster. The film took two years to complete. Every time the project was screened to the Central Committee, they would send it back for reshoots. They liked the script, but nothing Eisenstein did just seemed to be right. Their objection ranged from things to the use of biblical symbolism in the movie to confusing class warfare for the battle of good and evil. And of course, the worst accusation an artist can get? Formalism. Eisenstein was making Bayesian's Meadow only because it offered him an opportunity to indulge in formalistic exercises, Shumiatsky complained. Instead of creating a strong, clear, direct work, Eisenstein detached his work from reality, from the colors and heroism of reality. 
he consciously reduced the work's ideological content. Artists tried to help smooth things out. Esfir Schub attempted diplomacy and appeasement, saying that because Eisenstein had been out of the country for the first five-year plan, he wasn't accustomed to the new ways of doing things. Others also rushed to Eisenstein's defense. Chumiatsky would have none of this. He was not going to let out-of-control directors get in the way of his plans. The failed project of Bajan's Meadow was a black mark on Shumiatsky. He could feel his autonomy slipping from him. In 1936, an arts committee was formed. Shumiatsky was made to submit all movies to the committee for yet another layer of approval. He ignored them. The head of the arts committee wrote to Stalin, complaining that Shumiatsky was not seeking their approval. Shumiatsky wrote to Stalin, saying that the committee was a duplication of roles and unnecessary. Each wrote more and more letters to the Kremlin in an attempt to prove their loyalty. Shumiatsky increased his control over the industry even more. He was hell-bent on making sure another Bayesian Meadow incident would never happen again. In a three-day conference on film, Shumiatsky's opening speech was one long denunciation of Eisenstein, back when such denunciations were lethal. He wrote to Stalin directly, suggesting that Eisenstein should be banned forever from making films. No one would ever defy him again. No one will get in his way of running a tight, orderly ship. Shumiatsky would have his Soviet Hollywood. He would have his producer model. And he would have his discipline. And then, in a cold January morning in 1938, the secret police came knocking on Shumiatsky's door. A technician went inside the Kremlin to fix a projector and accidentally dropped some mercury on the floor. He was accused of treason, and because Shumiatsky had given the technician a pass, he was also to blame. The Pravda newspaper released articles denouncing him. In the summer of 1938, he was shot, one of the countless victims of Stalin's great terror. Semyon Dukelsky headed the cinema committee. He was even more draconian. In 1932, Shumiatsky had a plan to release 200 films a year. In 1938, 38 films were made. Dukelsky only lasted a year in his role. Ivan Bolshokov took over next. He seemed more receptive to input from others. Mikhail Rom, director and friend of Eisenstein, complained to Bolshokov about the excessive censorship. He suggested the establishment of a creative union of filmmakers. Relations between filmmakers and cinema administration had soured considerably, and the rift needed fixing. Bolshakov agreed. He made some decrees relaxing the restrictions on cinematographers. Although Bolshakov still had to read every script and watch every movie, he proposed that the committee should only give their approval to the original version. The studio was given autonomy to develop the final version. This decree was never implemented, because it was made in 1941. And in 1941, the Nazis invade the USSR. Oh my god, we're just not going to catch a break this episode. The Eastern Front of World War II, the Great Patriotic War as it was known there, would see the worst of the fighting, the heaviest tolls in the entire war. The film industry moved to Alma'ara and the Kazakh regions. It then began the largest mobilization of the film industry that the world would ever see. In some ways, there were echoes of the Civil War era. The agit trains were repurposed and sent across the country with newsreels about the war efforts. Thousands of camera operators stayed behind in Moscow to shoot these newsreels. And this time, fiction movies were also recruited. They created a variety of shorts of different genres, some comical, some melodramatic. Here are two examples. Three in a Shell Hole depicts a Soviet soldier, a German soldier, and a Soviet nurse holed up together. The nurse, in a sense of duty and compassion, mends the wounded German soldier, only to have him try to murder her. The enemy was just that dastardly. An example of a comedy short, The Telegraph Office. Napoleon is in a telegraph office, sending a message to Hitler, dissuading him from invading Moscow. I've tried it. I don't recommend it. The movies at the time emphasized nationalism, patriotism, and the friendship of the people. Nazi propaganda attempted to stir national hostilities between the different ethnic groups of the Soviet Union. And movies countered that propaganda through films depicting the soldiers of different groups standing shoulder to shoulder in camaraderie. 
At the same time, Stalin quietly removed any references to communism, emphasizing patriotism to the motherland and loyalty to the leader. This was going to have significant reverberations to the USSR's identity till the very end. Something else significant was happening. With a clear and present danger, a shared enemy in the form of Hitler and the Nazis, there was a mending of a rift that had opened up in the 1930s. After butting heads for all of that decade, after all the frustrations, the liquidations and the terrors, the party, the filmmakers, and the movie administrators found a common cause for the first time in a long time. Peter Kenna's in their essay, Films of the Second World War, describes it perfectly. Quote, The irony of the history of Soviet cinema is that during the war, directors made propaganda films, which by definition distort reality. They depict the enemy as uniformly vicious and stupid, and the Soviet people as clever and heroic. And yet these films were more realistic than anything the studios had produced, either immediately before 1941 or immediately after 1945. In the Stalinist years, artists did not dare touch upon any genuine issue facing society. Directors either turned to the past for subject matter or depicted a never-never land of smiling and singing collective farm workers who cheerfully competed against one another in fulfilling the plan. In this context, the war, in spite of the dreadful destruction and suffering it caused, was a liberating experience. Films once again expressed genuine feeling and real pathos. The hatred for the enemy, the call for sacrifice and heroism, and the sorrow for the suffering Soviet people were real and heartfelt. The directors believed in what they were saying. The period of the war was a small oasis of freedom in the film history of the Stalinist years. End quote. When the war seemed to be turning in the Soviets' favor, the films took on a much more heroic tone. 1943 saw two of the most well-known films of the Great Patriotic War. The Vasiliev brothers of Chapayev fame released The Front, which depicts the generational shift that the war had caused. The other film is She Defends the Motherland directed by Frederick Ermler. She Defends the Motherland tells the story of a woman, Lukyanova, who loses both husband and son when the Nazis take over their village. In true socialist realism manner, the collective efforts of the people gets the job done under their wise leader, Lukyavona, as she organizes them in a guerrilla unit to fight off the Nazis. Female protagonists were actually a common theme in the war movies of the time. In addition to She Defends the Motherland, we have Zoya and Rainbow, Historically, the all-women fighting units of the Soviet Union were some of the most feared fighters of the war. One of the participants in the war efforts was one Alexander Dovzhenko. See, Ukraine was one of the first places to fall to the Nazis, and Dovzhenko felt this loss keenly. Unlike his fellow directors, Dovzhenko chose to remain in Moscow and film the battle-ravaged areas to document the history unfolding before him. I will write about the sufferings, heroism, and tragedy of my nation. I have thought and planned much, and I shall undoubtedly be able to accomplish something before I die, Dovzhenko wrote to his wife. He was talking about his book, Ukraine in Flames. 1943 saw the release of the Battle of Our Soviet Ukraine. Dovzhenko's love of the land, his ability to film the vast Ukrainian landscapes, adds an aesthetic touch that other documentaries didn't possess. Unfortunately, the sense of union the people felt during the war didn't last very long. Dovzhenko, once the favorite of Stalin, found himself at odds with the Kremlin over his story. Here's how he recounted it. Quote, Back in Moscow today, brought my elderly mother with me from Kiev. Bolshakov gave me distressing news today. Stalin took a dislike to my story, Ukraine in Flames, and has forbidden it from being published or screened. I don't know yet what to do. My heart is heavy and anguished. Not because more than a year of work has been wasted, and not because all my enemy will rejoice and all the petty functionaries will disdain me, but because I know that Ukraine in flames is true. It is my concealed and forbidden truth about my nation and its calamity. The ban means that no one needs my story. Evidently, only panegyrics are needed. End quote. We finally start seeing the true feelings of Dovzhenko towards the whole affair. Charges of nationalism had plagued him from his very first trilogy, and back then it was only the intervention of Stalin that saved him. And this time, the person in charge of Ukraine, Khrushchev, remember his name, accused Dovzhenko once more of nationalism. And it seems like this time, Stalin agreed. Dovzhenko poured out his feelings of being accused in his diaries. 
this time ones that were still kept intact. Quote, My dear fellow Stalin, even if you were God, I would never believe that I am a nationalist who should be dishonored and confined. When there is no hatred, no contempt, and no malevolence, not even to one nation in the world, nor to its fate, nor happiness, nor dignity, nor welfare, how can love of one's own nation be nationalism? Is nationalism a disobedience to the foolishness of officials and cold-blooded statesmen? Or an artist's inability to hold back tears when his people are hurt? Why did you make my life a torture? Why did you deprive me of my joy? Why did you slander my name? But I forgive you. While you are being so small, I forgive you and your small-mindedness and evil. Because you are also imperfect, no matter how many people pray to you. There is a God, but his name is Chance. End quote. There was a feeling of optimism near the end of the war. People seeing parallels to the Civil War of 1918 to 1922 believed that after the Great Patriotic War, things would get better. New freedoms might be introduced. Maybe even another new economic policy, a new fellowship of man. Dovzhenko from the very beginning was pessimistic and prophetic. Quote, The end of the world war. People will start licking their wounds and make monuments as a tribute to commanders and their horses. Peace. Humankind has ended its tragedy in blood and corpse stench by inventing an atomic bomb. The atom is split. A sin against the entire world is committed. The bomb is dropped. So, peace. About what danger is the American shopkeeper Truman talking about today? Showing the atom bomb out of his pocket? Who knows? What is he afraid of? People are unharmed. Bomb is in the pocket? A lot of money. Is he not afraid of us having a bomb which will be bigger and more ferocious? And then we humans will live merrily like a feast before the last worldwide plague. The world war has ended. 40 million of my Soviet brothers and sisters died in tortures. My 80-year-old father died starving and I gravely wounded by my own people, am barely staying alive. What do I want? What do I need? Work. I want to work. And a little bit of happiness. I will have my work, but I won't have any happiness. I cannot be happy when people around me are miserable. I am ashamed. So ashamed, as if it were my fault that people are needy, poorly dressed, homeless, and exhausted. It's as if I had deceived them, lied to them, and sucked out their lives. As if I had taken their holidays, peace, kind-heartedness, and made them unhappy by making bad, stupid people with cold, frail souls their chiefs. Are they heroes or no? They are. Even more, twice, hundred times heroes and passion bearers. They engulfed Germany with their corpses and flooded it with their blood. The world war was ended with an atomic bomb. I want to work, and I want to believe till my death that humanity won't need any tanks, guns, and all that stupid atavistic garbage. All those monuments dedicated to great murderers and their horses, and honors to snipers, marshals, and mad partisans who ruin ten times more of their own people than Germans, that there will be peace, and there will be no need for hero martyrs. End quote. I want to work. This was something Verdov also said when he was falling out of favor from the party. In the middle of all the chaos, all the terror and all the misery, the directors wanted to keep hold of the one thing that was meaningful for them. No matter what. Dovzhenko kept working. He was cast to work on Maturin, a movie about a Russian botanist and his discoveries. More interventions, more layers of bureaucracy, more accusations of formalism. He just worked on the film and gave in when the by now expected accusations arrived. The end of the war saw a new wave of terror. New territories fell under the control of the party. More repressions. People who returned from the war were dealt with paranoid suspicion. The Cold War was about to begin, and so was to be until Stalin's death in 1953. We started with Eisenstein's plans for a movie. Let's end with one of his movies now. The later part of his career saw him working on historical epics. After the fiasco of Bayesian Meadow, Eisenstein was given one more chance to redeem himself in the eyes of the party. This time he was given a co-director, a Stalinist loyalist who would watch his every step and make sure he didn't go out of bounds. The movie he made was Alexander Nevsky. Nevsky 
a historical hero who defended the Russian lands against the Teutonic Knights in the 13th century. Not a coincidence, this came out in 1938, when Hitler and the Nazis were becoming a threat. The movie was met with approval and hailed as Eisenstein finally entering the socialist realism mold. In 1939, it was banned. The USSR signed a non-aggression pact with Hitler, so any anti-German sentiment had to be muffled. Then, in 1941, when Hitler broke the pact, Eisenstein was awarded with an Order of Stalin for the movie. The movie Alexander Nevsky has the structure and tropes of a Shakespearean drama. In fact, the movie reminds me of another director with a Shakespearean bent, Akira Kurosawa. It did seem like Eisenstein was finally coming into the fold and embraced by the Stalinist mainstream. He moved to Alma-Ata during the war, where he was tasked to make a movie about Ivan the Terrible, Ivan Gruzny, which translates to Ivan the Terrible, perhaps one of the better-known Tsars of history. Ivan the Terrible, as the name suggests, was not a particularly nice person. Ivan the Terrible was one of Stalin's favorite historical figures. Ivan became Tsar in a time where the boyars, the princes, held a huge amount of power. In a series of plots and intrigues and battles, he eventually cut off their powers, as well as most of their heads, while consolidating the absolute rule of the Tsar. To do this, he appointed the Oprichniki, his own personal guards from the people, and led their resentments against the oligarchic boyars free reign. Sounds familiar? There is a reason he was Stalin's favorite. Eisenstein was set to work. He had plans for a trilogy, but he had already suffered from a series of illnesses that slowed down his work. From 1942 to 1944, he worked through and managed to release the first film. He took no chances here, consulting Stalin and even the length of Ivan's beard. Ivan the Terrible Part 1 Ivan, played by Nikolai Tcharkasov, one of Stalin's favorite actors, well known for his ability to perform high-status characters. The movie starts with Ivan's coronation and important events in the Tsar's early life, including the Battle of Kazan and the forming of the Oprichniki. It's high drama at its finest. Eisenstein's eye for light and shadow, along with Cherkasov's Shakespearean acting abilities, create a solemn movie which exalts the subject matter. A perfect building of the cult of personality. And then part two happened. I... I don't know how to describe this. The whiplash between one and two is incredible. The second movie is the beginning of Ivan's plot against the boyars, and... It's... Well, okay, personal opinion? It's camp. It's very, very campy. That's the only word I can use to describe this. The acting choices are... something. Film critic Roger Ebert describes Cherkasov's acting in part two as a parody of his acting in the first movie. It's quite unhinged. But while Ebert meant that as a criticism, I'm not quite sure if it actually was. We tend to give famous directors this aura of extreme seriousness. Think of their works as something untouchable. But Eisenstein, despite the highly intellectual nature of his movies, wasn't stuffy. This was a guy who could embrace French classics and Disney animated shorts. I won't describe too many details about the film. I highly recommend you give it a watch and form your own opinions about it. Personally, I'd watch part two over part one any day of the week. But the big question, how did this happen? What was Eisenstein's motivation for creating such a different movie from the first one? The first movie's tone was exactly the kind of cult building Stalin wanted. Eisenstein must have known that this movie would not have been well received. And boy was it not. The party was incensed. They threw all accusations at him. Formalism, historical inaccuracy, they accused him of turning the Oprichniki into the Ku Klux Klan and Ivan into an indecisive hamlet. Stalin called Eisenstein and other high-ranking members of the party into a late-night meeting to discuss all these points. Stalin told him the film could not stand, and Eisenstein was ordered to rework on the movie immediately. So th this is the question that's been in debate for a while now. Was all of this intentional? Was Eisenstein knocking down in part two the cult of personality he built in the first part? Alexander Solzhenitsyn, in his A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, has a character condemn Eisenstein for being a crony. He says, So don't come running to me shouting that Eisenstein is a genius. What you should say is that he's a groveling bootlicker. Geniuses don't suit their work to the whims of a tyrant. So what was Eisenstein's motivation? 
Some people think he genuinely believed the movie would be well received, given the fact that Eisenstein had repeatedly written to Stalin to ask for help. Herbert Marshall, a biographer of the early Soviet directors, disagrees. He sees in Ivan the Terrible Part II an intentional attack at Stalin. He quotes Mikhail Rahm's diary on the day the movie was screened. Quote, When the film was completed, a group of directors was summoned to the ministry. We were told, just look at Eisenstein's film. There will be trouble. Help us decide what to do. We saw it and felt the same alarm and the same disturbed feeling as those of the ministry. But Eisenstein conducted himself with alarming gaiety. He asked us, what's the matter? What's wrong? What have you got in mind? Tell me straight. But no one dared tell him straight that in Ivan the Terrible was sensed a pointed allusion to Stalin, in Malia Churatov an allusion to Beria, and in the Oprichniki an allusion to his Myrmidons. And there was a lot more we sensed and dared not say. But in the boldness of Eisenstein, the flash of his eyes, in his challenging, skeptical smile, we felt that he acted consciously, that he decided to go the whole hog. It was terrifying. End quote. So what was his motivation? Regardless of what his political motivations were, what I see in Ivan the Terrible Part 2 is pure, unrestrained, creative exuberance. We can glean the opinions of people living under the Stalin era from their diaries and personal reflections. Not fully, of course. Some of them were still being monitored. But sometimes opinions escape. We've seen Verdov's feeling of isolation and Dovzhenko's bold attack on Stalin in his personal writings. What do we see in Eisenstein's diaries and notes? We see pages and pages of sketches, notes, ideas for movies and experiments that would never be realized. Hundreds of historical notes, anecdotes, ideas, theories being forced to stay within those pages, partly due to his own limitations, but also due to the restrictions imposed on him. These ideas were to remain locked. And I think, somehow, some of these ideas escaped in Ivan Part Two. In the weird, unhinged acting, we see the experimental acting methods of Meyerhold, Eisenstein's mentor during his theater days. Meyerhold, who had been another victim of Stalin's terror. In Ivan's psychological turmoil, we see Eisenstein imaginatively identifying with history and making something new. In the bizarre play within a play in the movie is Eisenstein's fascination with Eastern theater, particularly Kabuki. It was an exhalation in the middle of the most repressive times. Was it to be the beginning of a renaissance? Would Eisenstein be forced to conform for his reshoots of part two or worse? We'll never find out. Eisenstein, already sick, died in 1948. Part three was never made. Part 2 was released more than a decade later, after Stalin was buried and the cult of personality dismantled. After Stalin's death in 1953, a period of de-Stalinization began. Socialist realism was still the preferred artistic movement, but some freedoms were reintroduced. A synthesis of the avant-garde of the 20s, the socialist realism of the 30s, and the historical patriotic films of the 40s was going to emerge and a new generation of filmmakers would carry the mantle of the early Soviet directors.